Chapter 64 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Sverre's Immediate Successors When Sverre died, his only living son, Haakon Sverreson, ascended the throne. Sigurd, Haakon's older brother, who died some time previous, left a young son, Guttorm, but no attempt was made to secure for him any share in the kingdom. The principle that the realm should be ruled by a single king was thus tacitly accepted by all. On his deathbed, Sverre had written a letter to his son, in which he advised him to bring about a reconciliation with the church, and Haakon invited the bishops, who were still staying in Denmark, to meet him for the purpose of arraying a satisfactory settlement. The bishops gladly accepted the offer, as they were tired of living in exile, and the archbishop even revoked the interdict without awaiting the permission of the pope. An agreement was reached, the terms of which were embodied in a proclamation issued by the king, but this document was couched in a language so vague that it is impossible to determine definitely what concessions were made by either side. It is quite clear, however, that the king did not recede from the position taken by Sverre, except on minor points, while the bishops were required to swear allegiance to him as their lawful sovereign. The clergy seem to have been anxious to bring about a reconciliation on almost any terms. The Bogler party had been so weakened by defeats that they could have little hope of success if the struggle were renewed, and they learned to their sorrow that the dreaded weapons of the Pope, excommunication and interdict, had been of little real aid. The clergy ceased to oppose the king, and kept aloof from future struggles for the throne. The Bogler, who were still led by the doughty Bishop Nicholas, became a political faction, and their conflict with the Berkebeiner lost all real significance. While Hawkins Ferrison lived, the Bagler did not attempt any new uprising, as his right to the throne could not be questioned, but his peaceful reign was cut short by a sudden death on New Year's Day, 1204. Hawkins Ferrison was thought to have died childless, and his brother Sigurd's four-year-old son, Guthorm, was chosen king. Hawkins Galen, son of King Sverre's sister Cecilia, a brave warrior and dashing noble, was made regent during his minority. The Bogler party now thought that the opportunity had come for them to regain their lost power. Bishop Nicholas sought to persuade them to place his nephew, Philip Simonson, on the throne, but he was merely a noble, and they chose instead the pretender Erling Steinweg, who claimed to be an illegitimate son of Magnus Erlingson, and Philip Simonson was elevated to the rank of Jarl. Thereby, the Bugler also repudiated the constitution of 1164, which excluded illegitimate sons from the throne. King Valdemar the Victorious of Denmark promised to aid Erling on condition that he should acknowledge him as suzerain. He came to Tunsberg with a fleet of 360 ships in 1204, and Erling Steinvog, Philip Simonsen, and the rest of the Bugler chieftains, true to their unpatriotic policy of former years, did homage to him as their overlord. Valdemar gave him thirty-five war vessels and returned to Denmark. This might have seriously endangered Norwegian independence, but Valdemar's wars with the Wends, and his campaigns in northern Germany, so completely absorbed his attention that he took no steps to maintain his supremacy over any part of Norway. Guttorm Sigurdsson died in August, and as the Berkebeiner would not recognize Erling Steinvag, a new king had to be chosen. A posthumous son, Haakon, had in the meantime been born to Haakon Sverreson by Inga of Vartag, probably in the month of June, but this was not yet known, and the choice fell on Inga Bardson, a son of King Sverre's sister Cecilia. His half-brother, Haakon Galen, was made Jarl and commander of the army, and one half of the royal income should fall to him. The struggle between the Berkebeiner and the Bogler was renewed. The Berkebeiner, who had Sverre's fleet, were the stronger party, but they nevertheless suffered heavy losses. In 1206, the Bogler surprised and took Trondheim, and captured their whole fleet. Many of the leading Berkebeiner fell, and King Inge Bardson barely escaped being taken prisoner. When Erling Steinweg died at Christmas time, 1206 to 1207, Philip Simonson was proclaimed king by the Bogler. They captured Bergen twice and destroyed the Svetterborg but their campaigns were mere raids undertaken at favorable moments when the Berkebeiner were stationed in other parts of the country. After years of bloodshed and destruction of property, neither side had any signal advantage to its credit. 
Both parties finally tired of this bloody feud, in which both were losers, and a peace was concluded in the summer of 1208 at Fittingsey. Philip received Viken as a fief, for which he did homage to Inge Bardsson as his overlord, and Ronrique was placed directly under King Inge. Thereby the independence and integrity of Norway was assured. Nothing seems to have been said about what title Philip was to bear, but he retained his royal seal and continued to call himself King Philippus. He received Sverre's daughter Christina in marriage, and their wedding was celebrated in Oslo in 1209. When the civil wars had been terminated by the Peace of 1208, friendly relations were established with Denmark, and both parties united in an expedition to the Orkneys, where Jarl Harald Madadsson had made himself independent and had reestablished his authority over the Shetland Islands. His sons, David and Jon, who were now Jarls, submitted without resistance, and they were allowed to retain the Orkneys on the condition that a great part of their income was granted to the king of Norway. King Ragnvald Gudrudsson of Man and the Hebrides, who had thrown off all allegiance, was also forced to submit. He went to Norway, swore fealty to King Inge, and promised to pay tribute. Such military expeditions furnished a welcome employment for the hosts of idle warriors who would have been a source of disturbance and danger in a period of peace. After the expedition returned from the Orkneys, many went on a crusade to Palestine under the leadership of the Bogler chieftain Rydar Sendemand, and Peter Steper, a nephew of King Svera. Steper died on the way, but Rydar reached the Holy Land. Later he entered the service of the emperor at Constantinople, where he died in 1214. During the last years of his pontificate, Pope Innocent III preached another general crusade in all the countries of Western Europe. Many leading men in Norway took the cross, and King Inge, who was too ill to leave home, promised to send ships and warriors to aid the crusaders, but he died in Trondheim, April 23, 1217, before the Fifth Crusade had commenced. End of chapter 64. Chapter 65 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Haakon Haakonsson and Skule Jarl. King Haakon Haakonsson came from the unknown, like his great predecessors, Olaf Tryggvason, Olaf the Saint, and Sverre Sigurdsson. He was an illegitimate child, born in obscurity by Inge of Varteig after King Haakon Sverresson's death. Had he fallen to the hands of King Sverre's old enemies, his history would probably have been short, but the faithful Berkebeiner guarded the child against the plotting Bogler chieftains. The Haakon Haakonsson saga gives the following account of Haakon's early years. Throned priest knew that Haakon Sverresson was the child's father. He baptized it and kept this so secret that he did not dare to let anyone bring it to the baptism, save his two sons and his wife. He reared the child in secrecy. There was a man called Erland of Husabo, a relative of King Svera, of Gutorm Gralbarda's family. Thrawn priests sought Erland and spoke to him about the child, and they agreed that it had to be kept hidden as well as possible. The first year the child stayed with Thrawn priest. But the next winter, before Christmas, Thrond and Erlen made ready to go northward from Borgersysl, and they took the prince and his mother with them. They went with the greatest possible secrecy to Oplenene. On Christmas Eve they came to the city of Hamar in Hedemarken, where there were two Berkebein Sisselmaind, Frederick Slaffa and Gjavald Gauta. They had a large number of men, and were much afraid because the Bagler were round about in Oplenene. Bishop Ivor was in Hamar at the time, and he was then, as always, a bitter enemy of Sverre's family and of all the Berkebeiner. However secretly they went with the child, the bishop soon learned that a king's son had come to the city. The bishop then invited the prince and his mother to stay with him during Christmas, saying, as in sooth was the case, that the prince was his relative. But the Berkebeiner did not trust him, and answered, saying that the king's son should come to him after Christmas that both he and his mother were now too tired from the journey to stay where so many people were assembled. But as soon as Christmas Day was over, the Sisselmaind took three horses and brought the prince and his mother away from the city. They did not stop until they came to Lillehammer, where they remained on a little farm in the greatest secrecy till after Christmas. 
During Christmas the Birkebeiner sent word to Toten and all neighboring districts, and summoned all the Birkebeiner to meet them. After Christmas they left Hamar and came to Lillehammer, and took the prince and his mother with them, and went to Osterdalen, whence they would go to Trondheim. On this journey they suffered much from cold, snow, and bad weather. At times they had to spend the night in forests and in uninhabited wilds. One evening the weather became so bad that they did not know where they were. They then sent Thorsten Skevla and Skervald Skrukka, two of the best ski runners, in advance with the prince. They got two men who were well acquainted with the locality to act as guides. They traveled as fast as they could, but did not find the way to the settlements. They came then to some out-farm sheds, made fire, and prepared a bed there for the child. Later the guides returned to find the others, and they came back to the sheds about midnight. It was uncomfortable to stay there, for it was dripping everywhere when the snow was melted by the fire, and most of them thought they might as well stay outside as inside. They had no other food for the child than snow, which they melted and poured into its mouth. The place where they stayed was called Navardal. Afterwards, walking became so difficult that they could not break a path through the snow otherwise than by pounding it down with their spear handles. In Usterdal, the people helped them in every way. Wherever they came, they lent them horses and guided them on the road. Thoughtful men have said that the troubles and difficulties which the Birkebeiner encountered on this journey, and the fear they also had for their enemies until they came to Trondheim with the prince, could best be compared with the dangers to which Olaf Tryggvason and his mother Ostrid were exposed when they fled from Norway to Svitiod from Gunhild and her sons. The Birkebeiner brought Haakon to Trondheim to King Ingebardsson, who reared him and acknowledged him to be the son of Haakon Sverreson and rightful heir to the throne. Among Sverre's old veterans, the boy was a great favorite. He was very lively, though small and young in years. He was very mature in his speech, so that the Jarl and all who knew him had great fun over his comical sayings. Often two of the Birkebeiner took him, one by the head and the other by the feet, and stretched him in fun, saying that this would make him grow, for it seemed to them that he was growing too slowly. When King Inge died, the ambitious Skola Bardson, his brother, openly aspired to the throne, although he supported for a time King Inge's eleven-year-old son, Guttorm. But the Birkebeiner, led by Vegard af Veradal, a prominent man within the herd, rallied around Sverre's young grandson, Haakon Haakonsson, who proved to be a more popular candidate. Skulu pretended to doubt Haakon's royal descent. He sought the support of the clergy, reaffirmed the constitution of 1164, which excluded illegitimate sons from the throne, and sought to prevent the choice of a king as long as possible. Haakon's supporters grew impatient. The herd assembled under Vegard's leadership, and demanded that Haakon should be proclaimed king without further delay. A letter was also brought from the Gulathingslag by the Birkebein chieftain, Dogfin Bonda, stating that if the Trunders hesitated to proclaim Haakon king, who was the rightful heir to the throne, they would immediately hail him as king at the Gulathing. The Urathing was then assembled, and Haakon was proclaimed king of Norway, 1217, at the age of thirteen. Accompanied by Skule Jarl, Haakon then went to Bergen, where he was also hailed as king. It was decided that Skula should receive one-third of all the royal revenues, but he was jealous and dissatisfied. He plotted with the Bagler, persuaded King Philippus in Viken to demand one-half of the revenues of the kingdom, and without Haakon's knowledge and consent he used the royal seal, which was still in his possession. Archbishop Guttorm and the bishops would not acknowledge Haakon before he had given better proof of his royal birth, and the matter was referred to a council of magnates which assembled at Bergen in 1218 where the archbishop, bishops, and lindermand were present. Inge of Vartig had to submit to trial by ordeal to prove that Haakon was the son of Haakon Sverreson. She passed the ordeal successfully, and Haakon's elevation to the throne was sanctioned by the council. The archbishop and the clergy acknowledged him the lawful king of Norway, and Skule Jarl could no longer resist with any show of right. The king granted favors without partiality to the leaders of all groups, and the Bagler now disappeared as a distinct party. In 1218, a new rebel band, the Slitungs, had assembled in the border district of Marker, and had chosen as their leader a pretender by the name of Bene, or Benedict. They caused great disturbance in many districts, 
but were finally dispersed by the united forces of the Bogler and Berkebeiner. The Ribungs, who appeared later, were more powerful, and their leader Sigurd Ribung, who claimed to be a grandson of Magnus Erlingsson, carried on a guerrilla warfare in the southeastern districts for many years. They did not disappear until 1227, after Sigurd Ribung's death. In order to establish a more permanent friendship between the king and Skule Jarl, Haakon was betrothed to Skule's daughter Margaret in 1219, but she was at that time only nine or ten years of age, and their marriage was not solemnized until 1225. The new distinction of being the king's father-in-law flattered the ambitious Jarl, and for a time he seems to have been well disposed towards King Haakon. It may have been evident even to school of Jarl that it would be impossible at that moment to organize a successful revolt against the popular grandson of King Sverre. The whole nation was weary of the endless feuds between rival pretenders, and longed to bind up their many wounds. With intuitive foresight, born of secret but earnest longing, they were soon able to prognosticate that Hawken Hawkinson would inaugurate a new era of peace, towards which many looked as to a promised land after many generations of bloody civil strife. The martial notes died away in song and saga, and the writers tell us with rejoicing how Hawkins' peaceful and benign reign made the land blossom, and nature grow suddenly fruitful as if awakened by a new impulse. When Hawkins was made king, it was such a good year in the land that it was general that fruit trees blossomed two times, and that the birds laid eggs twice, says the saga. The skald Sturla Thordson says in a song about King Hawkins, it is certain that twice blossomed the fruit trees in one summer, and that from the beginning of the year wild birds laid eggs twice without suffering from cold, when the ruler, desirous of glory, had taken the name of king, and his good fortune, destined to reach the highest fame, began to grow. Saw then all that the elements on the wide ocean-encircled earth would welcome the noble king. All might now have been well, but ambition gave Skule Jarl no rest. It stole the contentment from his heart, and filled his mind with treasonable thoughts. In 1223 he went to Denmark to visit King Valdemar the Victorious, who was at that time the most powerful monarch in the north. It seems to have been his plan to make himself king of southern Norway by Valdemar's aid, and to acknowledge him as his overlord. But Valdemar had been taken prisoner by one of his own vassals, Henry of Schwerin, and Skula had to resort to his old method of intriguing against Haakon. In 1223, the king would be of age, 18 years old. Skula could no longer act as his guardian, and the last remnant of royal power would slip from his hands. He had not abandoned his claim to the throne, and his attitude grew more hostile as the time approached when Hawken would hold the reins of power. But even under these circumstances, Hawken showed the wise moderation which distinguished him throughout his whole reign. No one could justly question his title to the throne, but he nevertheless summoned a council to meet at Bergen on Olafmas, July 29, 1223, where all pretenders should meet and have their claims carefully examined. A greater meeting of notables had never been assembled in Norway. Beside the king sat the Lendermand, Sisselmand, and Logmand from the whole kingdom, the archbishop, the bishops, and many other ecclesiastics. The Orkneys were represented by Jarl Jon and Bishop Bjarne, the Faroe Islands by Bishop Serkva, and the Shetland Islands by Archdeacon Nicholas, and the royal Sisselman Gregorius Kick, who was married to King Sverre's daughter Cecilia. The pretenders present were Skule Jarl, Guttorm, son of Inge Bordson, Sigurd Ribung, and Junker Knut, son of Haakon Galen, and a nephew of King Sverre. After all claims had been carefully examined, the Logmain declared that Haakon Haakonsson was the rightful heir to the throne, and the archbishop solemnly proclaimed him the lawful king of Norway. Skula was to rule over one-third of the kingdom, but had to swear fealty to the king. He received Trondelagen, Holagerland, Nordmer, Romsdal, and Sundmer. In these northern districts, where the people were very loyal to King Sverre's family, he would find small opportunity to secure aid from Denmark if he should venture to attempt an uprising against the king. In the opinion of posterity, as well as in the eyes of his own times, Hawkin Hawkinson was a truly great king, who ruled with wisdom and carried himself with dignity. In his day, Norway reached the zenith of her power. 
the great activity in literature and architecture, the splendor of his court, and the high honor which he enjoyed among the crowned heads of Europe, made his reign the Augustan age in Norwegian history. King Haakon was rather short of stature, says the saga, but he was well-built and broad-shouldered. In appearance he resembled King Sverre. He had a broad face and fair complexion, fine hair and large, beautiful eyes. He was cheerful, quick, and lively, always kind to those who were poor and in distress. Wise men who were sent to him from other rulers said that they had seen no prince who seemed to be more truly both companion, king, and lord. We notice in King Haakon a quiet dignity and calm judgment coupled with magnanimity and rare mental equipoise. He adhered firmly to the policy inaugurated by Sverre, but his statesmanship was broad-minded and clear-sighted. Though firm in principles, he was generous and conciliatory in minor matters. He reconciled and united all factions, built, legislated, and improved, and rounded into completion the work of his great predecessors Harald Harfagre, Olaf Tryggvason, St. Olaf, and King Sverre. Even his family life was an ideal one. In 1225 he married Skule Jarl's daughter, Margaret, who was then about seventeen. She was a most affectionate wife, and clung to her husband with the greatest tenderness even when her father turned traitor and became Hawkins' implacable enemy. The feeling that he held the throne by unclouded title, and ruled a prosperous and united people by their full consent and undivided support, gave Hawken a confidence, and threw about his life and reign a halo of harmony and dignified repose, to which Skula's ill-starred career, torn by unsatiated ambition and treasonable plots, forms a most tragic contrast. Unable to remain satisfied within his proper sphere, though the magnanimous king granted him the greatest honors, knowing that he could not openly gain the throne to which he had no title, Skula's heart was torn by doubt. He hatched plots, used underhand means, tried finally open revolt, and paid for it all by yielding his life to his pursuers in a last obscure retreat. In the fight between the Ghibellines and the Welfs, the kings of Denmark supported the latter, as they feared the German emperor who attempted to make their kingdom a vassal state under the imperial crown. But the Danes in turn sought to establish an overlordship over Norway, or its southern provinces, and as Skule Jarl solicited King Valdemar's aid in his ill-concealed efforts to obtain the crown, King Haakon endeavored to counteract this move by entering into closer relations with the Ghibelline emperor Frederick II of Germany, the most powerful monarch in Europe at that time. Frederick sent ambassadors to Norway. Haakon called the emperor his friend, and it is quite apparent that he counted on his support if Valdemar and Skule Jarl should venture to attack him. He also entered into friendly relations with Henry III of England, and an agreement was made by which restrictions on trade between the two kingdoms were removed. After Hawken had taken the reins of government into his own hands, he had to devote much time and energy for several years to put down the Rubung uprising. When Sigurd Rubung died in 1226, Junker Knut became the leader of these rebels. They had always received aid from the border provinces in Sweden, and Knut's mother, Christina, who was married to Logmand Eskel in Vestergötland, aided her son liberally. But Haakon pushed the campaigns against him with such vigor that Canute submitted and disbanded the Ribungs in 1227. Haakon now returned from Oslo to Bergen. Near Lindesnes he met Skule Jarl, who was on his way to Denmark with many large ships to aid Valdemar the Victorious. The Danish king had regained his liberty, and was endeavoring to punish his rebellious vassals and regain the territory which he had lost. Haakon did not upbraid Skule, though he met him on so suspicious an errand, but he could inform him that Valdemar had just suffered a crushing defeat at Bornhoved. Skula, who understood that he could accomplish nothing in Denmark under these circumstances, returned with Haakon to Bergen. For some time the relations between the two were seemingly friendly, but Skula built a fleet of his own and conducted himself in a way which awakened grave suspicion as to his loyalty. In 1233 he was summoned before a council at Bergen to answer to charges preferred against him, but he boldly denied every accusation, and no further action was taken in the matter. King Hawkins still treated Skula with considerate regard, but the Jarl's conduct became more and more openly disloyal, especially after an illegitimate son, Peter, was born to him. 
In 1235 he took a step which might have plunged the country into civil war. For a second time he was summoned before a council of magnates at Bergen to explain his conduct. He left Trondhjem with twenty warships, but spent the whole summer in Steinavog, in Sundmer, and did not go to Bergen, though repeatedly requested to appear. The king finally sailed northward with a fleet of forty ships to meet him. Skule hesitated for a while. Some advised him to come to an understanding with the king. Others appealed to his pride and whetted his jealousy. He followed the advice to which his nature inclined him, left his ships on Hawkins' approach, and crossed the mountains into Oplanena and the southern provinces. In order to avoid an open conflict, the king made him the offer that he could collect the royal revenues of the southern one-third of the kingdom if he would not begin hostilities until a peaceful settlement could be negotiated. This offer was accepted by Skula, who used the respite thus granted to organize a new band of rebels called Fardbelgs. After repeated efforts, a reconciliation was again brought about between Hawken and Skula Jarl. A new division of territory was made by which Skula should have one-third of all the Sisler, or administrative districts, in the kingdom, and at the Urething in 1237 he was given the title of duke, hertug equals dux. He received no additional power, but the new title must have been granted him as the greatest honor which could be bestowed upon a subject, as it had never before been used in Norway. But even this new honor could not long satisfy the ambitious Jarl. The following year he took the decisive step. After collecting a large military force in Trundelagen and levying heavy taxes for its support, he assembled the Urething, where he was proclaimed king of Norway. He took the oath on the shrine of St. Olav, which his son Peter and a few others had forcibly removed from the Christ Church. In the opinion of many, this desecration of the sanctuary was a rather inauspicious omen for the rebellion thus set on foot. Skula sought to prevent word from being sent to the king of the step which he had taken. But the news was brought King Hawken in Bergen on the night of the 15th of November by Grim Kaiken, one of his herdmaind, who had succeeded in eluding the Varbelgs. The saga says, There were not many with the king when he received this news. He sat a while silent, and then said, God be praised that I now know the situation from this day on, for that which has now come to light has long been planned. He went to the queen's lodging and asked to be admitted. Light was burning in her apartments, and some of her servants and maids were sleeping there. The king approached her bed where she was standing in a silk sleeping gown. She threw a red cloak about her and greeted the king, and he returned her greeting cordially. She took a silk pillow and bade him be seated, but he declined. The queen then asked him if he had received any news. Nothing very important, he said, but now there are two kings in Norway. She said, only one can be the rightful king, and that is you. God and St. Olaf grant that it may always be thus. The king then told her that her father had been proclaimed king at the Urething. Things must still be better than that, she said, believe it or not, for God's sake, until you have received full assurance. Then she burst into tears, and she could say no more. The king bade her be of good cheer, and said that she should not suffer for her father's conduct. Shortly afterwards he left, and as soon as day came he caused mass to be said, and then summoned his counselors. Grimm was present and told them the news which he brought. It was then decided to send war bulletins both north and south from Bergen, and call thither half the Almenning. Skule Jarl sent his Varbugs into many districts to burn and pillage. He left Trondhjem and went to the southern provinces, where he gained some advantages over the king Sisselmend, but Hawkins soon arrived and defeated him in the Battle of Oslo. With a few followers, Skula fled northward to Trondheim, but the city was soon taken by the royal forces, and his son Peter was killed. For some days Skula roamed about in the forests, not knowing what course to pursue. He finally sought refuge in the monastery of Elgesaiter, but the angry Berkebeiner set fire to it, forced him to come out, and slew him, May 24, 1240. This was the closing episode of the civil wars. Skula had attempted rebellion in an age which would not be disturbed. The uprising did not prove dangerous, and Hawken treated with the greatest leniency all those who had taken part in the revolt. 
End of chapter 65「Chapter 66 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Haakon's Coronation, Colonial Affairs King Haakon had long desired to be crowned, but because of his illegitimate birth, he had to obtain the Pope's dispensation, and so long as Skule Jarl lived, his efforts in this direction were frustrated. After Skule's death, he renewed the negotiations regarding the coronation, and Pope Innocent IV, who ascended the throne of the popes in 1243, encouraged him by a most friendly attitude. Innocent had maintained with more than usual vigor the supremacy of the pope, and as a result he soon quarreled with Emperor Frederick II. In his struggle with this powerful monarch he felt the necessity of keeping on friendly terms with other princes. To gain Hawkins' goodwill he sent Cardinal William of Sabina as a legate to Norway to crown him. He also wrote a letter by which he removed all blemish with regard to King Hawkins' birth, so that it should neither mar his royal dignity nor the right of his legitimate sons to inherit the crown. When the cardinal arrived in Norway, he tried to persuade Hawkins to acknowledge the overlordship of the pope, but when the king refused, he did not urge the point. The coronation took place in Bergen with great ceremony, July 29, 1247. The ceremonies in connection with the coronation are vividly described by the author of the Hawken Hawkinson saga. The Olav Mass Eve was a Sunday. On the Olav's day, Mass was sung in the whole city, whereupon the people were summoned to the Christ Church by the blowing of trumpets. Eighty herdmaned in military attire cleared the way to the church. The royal procession was arranged thus. First came the herdmaned, who were to clear the way, two abreast. Then the standard-bearers with standards, the skutelsfeiner, and the sisselmaned in fine attire, and the lendermaned with beautiful swords. Thereupon came four lendermaned carrying aloft a table on which were placed the coronation robes and all the royal insignia. After them came Sigurd, the king's son, and Munon Bishopson, carrying two silver scepters, one ornamented with a golden cross, and the other with a snake of gold. Then came the younger King Hawken with a crown, and Jarl Knut carrying the coronation sword. Archbishop Sigurd and two bishops escorted King Hawken. At the entrance to the royal residence, the priests in procession met the king and chanted the responsory, Eke mito angelum meum after which they proceeded to the church. The cardinal, with his clerks and two bishops, stood by the church door, where they sang a song, whereupon they followed the king to the altar. Mass was then sung, and the coronation was carried out in the usual manner. After the mass, the archbishop and the bishops followed the king to his residence in the same order as before, singing hymns in praise of God. The king took off the coronation robes and put on the royal robes and insignia. The crown he wore the whole day. He then proceeded to the hall, where the royal banquet was prepared, together with all those who were to take part in it. The walls of the hall were hung with colored cloth, and cushions were placed there covered with pell and gold in woven silk. The seats were so arranged that the king sat by the north wall between the inner pillars. At his right sat the cardinal, the archbishop, the bishop of Bergen, and other bishops. On the right side, toward the sea, sat the abbots, the priors, the provosts, and other learned men. In the middle of the hall, over against the high seat, was a second high seat where the younger King Hawkins sat, together with Jarl Knut and Sigurd, the king's son, and many lendermen sat on either side of them. On the king's left sat the queen, and next to her sat her mother, Ragnhild, then Christina and Cecilia, the king's daughters, abbess Rangrid, the abbesses, and other ladies. Along the southern wall sat the king's herd. Two rows of tables extended along the middle of the hall from one end to the other. Outside of these sat the guests, also by two rows of tables. In all there were thirteen rows of tables along the hall. The multitude, who did not find room inside, stayed in tents around the hall. Cardinal William of Sabina spoke at the royal banquet of the impressions which he had received on his visit to Norway. He said, God be praised that I have now fulfilled the errand which was given in my charge by my lord the Pope. Your king is now crowned, and honored more highly than any king in Norway before. 
God be praised also that I did not turn back on the way, as I was urged to do so. I was told that I would find few people here, and if I found any, they would resemble animals in their conduct more than human beings. Now I see here a great assembly of the people of this country, and it appears to me that they show good manners. I see here so many men from foreign lands and such a multitude of ships that I have never seen a great number in any harbor, and I believe that most of these ships have been laden with good things for this country. They scared me by saying that I would get little bread or other food, and what I would get would be of poor quality, but it seems to me that there is such an abundance of good things that both houses and ships are full. I was told that I would get nothing to drink here but water and diluted milk, but I see an abundance of all good things. God help our king, the queen, the bishops, the learned men, and the whole people. He grant that my errand to this land may so terminate that it may be an honor to you, and a joy for us all, both in this life and in the life to come. The council of magnates which had gathered in Bergen for the coronation found opportunity also to discuss many features of state and church polity and by the aid of the cardinal many important reforms were carried through. The laws regarding the strict observance of Sunday and church holidays were modified. The cardinal found that the weather and the general environment had to be taken into due consideration, and that the people ought to be allowed to fish and to harvest their grain when there was an opportunity, except on the principal holidays. Trial by ordeal, Jarnberg, was abolished as the cardinal said that it was not proper for Christians to summon God as witness in human affairs. It is very probable that this reform was initiated by the king, who must have been as anxious as the cardinals to see this mode of trial abolished. His own mother, Inga of Vartag, had been forced to submit to ordeal to prove his royal descent, and many bold pretenders had by means of it made their claim to the throne. Those who rebelled against the king should be punished by excommunication. The queen was granted the right of Advausen over three royal chapels which the king had built, and also over missionary churches built on the border of the kingdom for the conversion of the heathens. It was an important concession, since the priests of these churches would stand under direct supervision of the king. The cardinal also adjusted many minor complaints of the people and the lower clergy against the bishops, and he finally issued a proclamation regarding the relation of church and state in Norway, or what he considered to be their relation. He said that he found the church in full and peaceful possession of separate jurisdiction in all ecclesiastical affairs, whosoever were the parties in the case, and over the clergy in all cases whatsoever. He also found that the church had full right of advocacy except in case of the royal chapels above mentioned, and finally that the election of bishops and prelates was made by the clergy according to the right granted them by the canon law, without interference of secular authority. These rights were universally claimed by the Catholic Church at that time, but it is by no means clear that the Church of Norway possessed them in the degree here stated by the cardinal. King Svera, and likewise his successors, maintained the right of the king to sanction the choice of bishops. The bishop-elect had to be presented to the king, who in this way exercised great influence on the election. As to the right of Advesen, there was much dispute, and the Old Norse Church laws recognized no ecclesiastical courts. Kaiser thinks that the proclamation was a secret document placed by the cardinal in the hands of the bishops, to be used at some future moment. After a generation or two, it could be appealed to as an authority. To further please King Haakon, the cardinal sent a letter to Iceland, requesting the Icelanders to acknowledge the overlordship of the king of Norway. He did this, also, because the Roman church did not recognize a republic as a legitimate government. Haakon immediately sent a governor, or Sisselmand, to Iceland to assert the king's authority over the island. The Norse colonial empire, which had been founded in the Viking Age, was still intact. The colonies in Ireland and Normandy, as well as the settlements along the coast of Scotland, Wales, and northern England, were no longer Norse communities. But Man and the Hebrides, the Orkneys, the Faroe Islands, and the Shetland Islands were still Norse colonies and Greenland and Iceland, though politically independent, were tied to the mother country as closely as ever before. Norway's commerce and her power at sea depended in a large measure on her colonial possessions, through which she still maintained an open highway of trade and communication with the countries of the West. 
The revenues directly obtained were often in arrears when measured with the cost of fitting out military expeditions to keep the chieftains in these island possessions in due submission, but the kings of Norway guarded the colonies, not only because they were felt to be in a sense a part of Norway, but because they never lost sight of their real importance. The protracted civil wars had diverted the attention from affairs in the colonies, and tended to weaken the ties which bound them to the kingdom. But though their allegiance was severed at times, it was re-established quickly and without difficulty. A greater danger to Norse overlordship was the close proximity of many of these island groups to England and Scotland. That future development would lead to an absorption of these islands by the kingdoms to which they geographically belonged could not fail to be apprehended by foresighted statesmen. In 1158, the Kingdom of Man and the Hebrides was divided between King Gudrud and Sumerlida's son, Dugald. Ragnvald, Reginald, Gudrudson, who succeeded his father in 1187, threw off all allegiance to Norway, but the expedition to the Orkneys and Hebrides in 1209-1210 to forced Ragnvald and his son Gudrud to repair to Norway and offer their submission to King Ingeborgson. Ragnvald took his oath of allegiance lightly. In 1219 he swore fealty to King Henry III of England, and in obedience to a request made by the papal legate, Pandulf, he issued a document dated September 1, 1219, by which he transferred the kingdom of man to the Church of Rome, and received it back as a fief from the Pope, promising to pay a yearly tribute of twelve marks sterling. The Pope formally accepted the gift May 23, 1223, and placed Ragnvald in his kingdom under the protection of St. Peter. A war now broke out between Ragnvald and his brother Olaf Svarte, whom he had imprisoned and ill-treated. Olaf, who had regained his liberty, attacked Ragnvald with a fleet of thirty-two ships, and forced him to divide his kingdom with him. Ragnvald sought aid in Scotland, and Earl Allen of Galloway, the most powerful of the Scotch magnates, acting as it appears under the instructions of the energetic King Alexander II, came to his support. In the bloody conflict which ensued, Ragnvald lost his life, and Gudrid, who had been maimed and blinded by Olaf, fled to Norway. But Owain made great preparations to attack Olaf, and even threatened to attack Norway, saying that it was no more difficult to go from Scotland to Norway than from Norway to Scotland, there being no less facility of finding ports or shelter for a fleet there than in the firths of Scotland. It was clearly the plan of King Alexander II to seize the islands, and Olaf, who was unable to cope with so powerful an enemy, hastened to Norway to seek aid. When news was brought by fugitives of the situation in Man and the Hebrides, King Hawken took the matter in hand. Olaf's most trusted lieutenant, Paul Balkeson, had sought the support of Skule Jarl, and the king could not trust one party much more than the other. He therefore divided Ragnvald's possessions between Olaf and Gudrud. Over the portion which had belonged to Sumerlida's son Dugald, he placed Uspak, Sumerlida's grandson, who was a veteran Birkebein chieftain in the king's service. He bestowed on him the title of king and gave him his own name, Hawken. When Olaf arrived in Norway, a fleet of thirteen ships commanded by Uspak Hawken was ready to sail to the colonies. Both Olaf and Gudrud returned with the fleet, which in the Orkneys received reinforcements till it finally numbered eighty ships. They sailed past Cantyre to Butte, where the Scots had strongly garrisoned Rothesay Castle. The castle was taken, but the Norsemen lost 360 men. Uspak Hawken was wounded and died shortly afterward. Olaf, who succeeded him as commander of the fleet, sailed to Man and took possession of that island. The division of the islands between Olaf and Gudrud was now consummated, and after Torquil MacDermot had been expelled from the island of Lewis, Ljodhus, the fleet returned to the Orkneys. Hostilities immediately broke out between the two kings and man in the Hebrides. Gudrud was slain, and Olaf seized the whole kingdom. But when the fleet returned to Norway, 1231, King Hawken thanked his men for what they had achieved. Norse sovereignty over these colonies had been maintained, and Allen of Galloway had not again attacked man or the Hebrides. In the Orkneys there were also feuds between rival chieftains and hostile factions. Jon Jarl was killed, and his successor Magnus held Caithness as a fief from the king of Scotland. The Orkney Jarls became more and more closely connected with Scotland and Scotch interests, 
and Caithness became the most important part of their possessions. The inhabitants, both in this province and in the Orkneys, were beginning to lose their Norse nationality. The number of Scotch settlers increased, and Scotch language and customs were gaining ground, an indication that Norse influence in these colonies was waning. End of chapter 66「Chapter 67 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Crusades and Crusaders In the summer of 1217 the Fifth Crusade began, and many chieftains from Norway took the cross and went to Palestine. Sigurd Kongsfranda, a nephew of King Sverre, seems to have been the first to depart. He journeyed through Denmark to Germany, and joined the army of crusaders which assembled at Spalato under the leadership of King Andrew of Hungary. The army reached the Holy Land, but accomplished nothing of importance, and King Andrew led his forces back to Europe. Erlend Thorbergson and Ruar Kungsfranda, another nephew of King Sverre, sailed with two ships for Palestine. The saga says, The same summer that the king and the jarl were in Viken, Ruar Kungsfranda went to Jerusalem. He had a large and beautiful ship. With him went a man by the name of Erland Thorbergson, who had another ship, which the townsmen had built at their own expense. Roar's ship came to Acre, but the townsmen's ship reached even Darmat, Damietta in Egypt, and both were successful on this expedition. Roar and Erland joined the large fleet collected in Germany, Holland, Denmark, Scandinavia, and England, which sailed from the Netherlands in the spring of 1217. On the way, they stopped in Portugal, where they captured the strong castle Alcazar from the Moors. The siege lasted until October, and they spent the winter in Lisbon. The next spring they sailed for the Levant, and joined the crusaders who were operating against Egypt. Damietta was taken in November 1219, after a long siege in which the capture of the chain tower was the most notable event. It is quite certain that the Norsemen played a prominent part in the capture of this stronghold, as they possessed great skill in that kind of warfare. Wilkins says that in order to capture this citadel, a remarkable tower was constructed on two ships. This corresponded to the Hunkastali, i.e. Turris Ambulatoria, which the Norsemen were accustomed to construct when they attacked fortified cities. The King's Mirror gives an elaborate account of the weapons and tactics employed in sieges. The father says to his son, When one is to attack a castle with the weapons which have been mentioned, that he also needs to have catapults, Volslinger, along, both stronger and weaker. The stronger to throw big stones against the walls, that they perchance may be made to fall by the great impact. The weaker to throw stones over the walls to destroy the houses within the castle. But if the stone walls cannot be broken down or rent asunder by the catapults, one must try to use a machine called a veder, i.e. a battering ram, covered in the end with iron. Few stone walls can stand against it. But if the stone walls should not be shaken apart or fall, then one can use, if he wishes, the grafsvin, a musculus constructed of boards and hides to protect the men while they undermine the walls. A tower built on wheels, i.e. turris ambulatoria, is also good to capture a castle with, if it is higher than the one which is to be taken, even if it is only seven ells, but it is better to take the castle with the higher it is. Ladders on wheels, which can be pulled back and forth, well covered with boards below and with railings on both sides, are also good for this use. In short, all weapons are good in the taking of a castle, but one who wishes to take part must know just when to use each weapon. But those who defend a castle may use most of the weapons here mentioned and many others, both big and small catapults, Valslinger, hand slings and stave slings, crossbows, lausbogi, are also good weapons for them, and likewise all other bows and other weapons to shoot with, lances and pole staves, both light and heavy. Against catapults and grafsvin, and against that which is called veder, battering ram, it is well to strengthen the walls inside with oak timbers, but if there is enough earth or clay, that is the best. Those who defend a castle make also great hurdles, flaky, of big oak branches, and cover the walls with three to five layers of them, but these hurdles should be well filled with sticky clay. Against the impact of the battering ram, 
they fill big sacks with hay and chaff, and lower them in light iron chains in front of the ram where it would strike the wall. There may be so much shooting that the men cannot stand in the embrasures, vigskard, then it is well to make hanging embrasures of light hurdles. They should be two ells higher than the real embrasures of the castles, and three ells deeper, and they must hang so far from the wall that the men can use all kinds of weapons between the real embrasures of the castle and the hanging ones. They must also hang on light beams which they can pull back and shove out again whenever they wish. An eagle kotr is also a good weapon for those who are to defend a castle. It must be made of big and heavy trees with oak spines along the back like a brush. It is fastened outside the walls by the embrasures, and it is dropped on those who approach the castle. Slagbrander, made of long, heavy trees, with sharp teeth of hard oak, are raised on end near the embrasures so that they may be dropped down on the men who approach the castle. A brinklunger, spider, is also a good weapon. It is made of good iron with bent teeth of steel, and on each tooth there is a barb. It must be made so that the ropes which are nearest to it, and higher than a man can reach, should be barbed iron chains so that they can neither cut them nor hold them fast. Above this point one may use any kind of rope if it is strong enough. Such a contrivance is good to throw down among the men to try to grab some and pull them up. The author mentions several other kinds of weapons together with hot water and molten glass and lead, which may be thrown upon the besiegers. Also a war machine called Skjoldjotun, which spews out fire and flames. How this was constructed is not known, but it must have been a machine by which fire and hot objects were hurled at the enemy. Even in earlier centuries the Vikings showed great engineering skill both in constructing and capturing fortified strongholds. And the high military science familiar to the author of The King's Mirror, who wrote his work in Hawk and Hawkinson's reign, probably in 1250 to 1260, justifies the assumption that the Norse crusaders played an important part in the captures of the fortresses at Damietta and other places. When the Norsemen returned from the crusade is not known, but the saga says that they came home in safety. The lenderman Gaut Jonsson returned from a crusade in 1218, and Ogmund of Sponheim, who made an expedition to the land of the Permians, Old Norse Bjarmeland, and journeyed through Russia by way of Novgorod and the Black Sea to Constantinople and Palestine, must also have taken part in the Fifth Crusade. Hawken was a statesman of high rank. He showed, indeed, less originality than his grandfather, King Sverre, but he acted with greater moderation, and managed foreign as well as domestic affairs with such wisdom and firmness that he won for his kingdom high honor and great influence among the powers of Europe. He continued to strengthen his fleet until Norway ranked all nations as a naval power a circumstance which, together with the king's great reputation as a statesman and ruler, gave his kingdom an influence which can best be seen in the efforts of the crowned heads to gain his friendship. He took no part in the struggle between the Welfs and the Hohenstaufers, Gulfs and Ghibellines, in Germany, but remained a friend both of the Pope and the Emperor. The throne of Germany was considered vacant by the Church, since the Pope had declared Emperor Frederick to be deposed and the cardinal was empowered by the pope to offer King Hawken the imperial crown, in honor which Hawken had wisdom enough to decline. He seems also to have been interested in the crusading movement which was now drawing to a close. At this time, the sixth crusade to the Holy Land was being prepared by St. Louis, King of France, as the quarrel between the pope and the emperor prevented the organization of a general crusade. Matthew Paris says that St. Louis invited Hawken to accompany him on the crusade, and offered him, as the powerful and experienced on the sea, the command of the whole French fleet. Louis the Ninth sent Matthew Paris to Norway with a letter to the king, but Hawken declined the honor. It seems that, although Hawken had pledged himself, probably in good faith, to embark on a crusade to the Holy Land, the Pope took no umbrage at his refusal to accompany King Louis. And it is not strange that the king hesitated to leave his kingdom and to spend his resources in distant lands at a moment when northern Europe was threatened by a grave danger. At the beginning of the 13th century, the great Tartar conqueror Genghis Khan united the tribes of Central Asia into a great empire. He subjugated China, Turkestan, India, and Persia, and after his death his son Oktai continued the work of conquest and devastation. He sent his nephew Batu Khan to subdue the countries of the West. In 1240, Kiev was sacked, 
and Russia, Poland, and Hungary were soon overrun by their hordes. But at Lignitz in Silesia their further progress was checked by the Germans under Henry the Pious. Batu Khan returned to Asia, but Europe was in great alarm. Many fugitives from Russia, especially Permians from the White Sea region, flocked into the districts on the Baltic Sea and also into Finmarken, where King Haakon permitted them to settle. The relations with the neighboring kingdoms, Sweden and Denmark, had not been good. Since the time of the Ribung revolt, the king of Sweden had maintained a hostile attitude, but Haakon finally succeeded in effecting a reconciliation. A treaty was concluded between the two kingdoms, and the bond of friendship was further strengthened by the marriage of the crown prince Haakon to Rikitsa, the daughter of Berger Jarl of Sweden. Denmark had also been unfriendly since the time of Valdemar the Victorious, and sharp commercial competition aggravated the situation. For some time, Haakon tried in vain to arrange a peaceful settlement. The growing enmity culminated in open hostilities, and Haakon sailed with a strong fleet to Copenhagen. A more serious clash was averted, however, by timely concessions made by the Danish king, and a treaty of peace was signed in 1257. During these troubles, the crown prince, Haakon the Younger, died, and his brother Magnus succeeded him as heir apparent to the throne. In 1261, his marriage to Ingebjörg, the daughter of the king of Denmark, was celebrated at Bergen. After the wedding festivities, King Haakon caused Magnus to be proclaimed king, and the young royal pair were crowned with elaborate ceremonies. With England, Haakon maintained very friendly relations and King Alfonso X the Wise of Castile sought to gain his friendship and support. He sent an embassy to Norway to bring about the marriage of Haakon's daughter Christina to his son Don Philip. Christina was escorted to Spain, and the wedding was celebrated at Valladolid. An alliance was formed between the two kings, in which it was stipulated, however, that Haakon should not be asked to aid Castile against England, Sweden, or Denmark nor should Alfonso X be requested to help Haakon against Aragon or France. King Haakon's life and reign reflect the high ideals, the Christian character, and true religious sentiment which gave his public acts, and all his measures of social and legal reform, a mark of moderation and goodwill. He held firmly to the principle that the king was the highest authority in church as well as in state, and placed himself squarely against every attempt to place new restrictions on the royal authority. But he had a high regard for the church. He adopted the measures which it advocated, when he found them to be just and beneficial. He dealt conscientiously with all ecclesiastical matters, and it was said to his praise that no king since St. Olaf had done so much to further Christianity in Norway. He accepted in part the plan so long advocated by the clergy regarding the succession. He adhered firmly to the principle that Norway should be an hereditary kingdom, but he recognized the expedience and wisdom of excluding illegitimate sons from the throne, so far as this could be done without endangering the hereditary principle. The new law of succession given at the Frosta thing in 1260 makes the provision that the one shall be king of Norway who is the king's oldest legitimate son, Odal born to realm and thanes. But if there is no legitimate son, then the king's son shall be king even if he is not legitimate, and if there is no son, then the one shall be king who is Odelborn, nearest in inheritance, and of the royal family. It was established then by this law that Norway in the future should be an undivided kingdom with a single king. In the succession, preference was given to the king's oldest legitimate son, but in order to preserve the strict principle of an hereditary monarchy, illegitimate sons or other members of the royal family might succeed to the throne. The king retained the old right of legislating for the church, and the code of church laws in the Frostathingslov was prepared under his supervision. This code was more in harmony with the canon law than the older church laws, and Hockett enforced it throughout the whole kingdom. The relation between the king and the church was thereby made clear. Since the king could make and amend the laws of the church, and since no ecclesiastical courts existed, but all cases had to be tried in the secular courts where the king's logman declared and interpreted the laws, the Church of Norway was a state church, subject to the authority of the king and the laws of the realm. King Haakon's legal reforms and his revision of the old codes of law was a work of the greatest importance. The change which had taken place in social conditions and in the moral and religious spirit of the nation 
made many of the old laws seem antiquated and even adverse in spirit to the prevailing public sentiment. It seems to have been Hawkins' aim to revise the old laws, both in church and state, so as to bring them into harmony with the more enlightened conception of justice. In 1244, he published an amended edition of the Frostathings Law, together with a code of church laws, Christenret, which seems to have been written by Archbishop Sigurd Andridesson of Trondheim, with the advice and sanction of the king. In 1260, a new revision of the Frostathings Law appeared together with many new laws, placing restrictions on feuds and the execution of personal vengeance. Hitherto, the friends and relatives of a person killed might proceed, not only against the slayer himself, but against his whole family, and instead of having recourse to legal justice, they often sought satisfaction for the injury by killing a near relative of the slayer. This often led to protracted and bloody feuds, which brought sorrow and suffering in their trail. This evil custom could not be abolished at once, but Hawken established the principle that the wrongdoer alone could be punished for his crime, a fundamental element of legal justice, which, once recognized, would form a new foundation for criminal jurisprudence. End of chapter 67「Chapter 68 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Annexation of Iceland and Greenland After the completion of the colonization of Iceland, after a system of laws and government had been established and Christianity had been acknowledged to be the state religion, the throes of organization were over, and the people enjoyed a period of peaceful development, which may be said to have lasted from about 1000 till 1150. By the adoption of the laws of Ulfljot in 930, the new state received its constitution. The Althing and the Fjordingsthings were organized, and the local Thing districts were limited to twelve, each with three Goder, except in the northern districts, or Fjordung, where there were four Thing districts, making in all 39 godord in Iceland. In 1004, a Supreme Court of Appeal, the Fimtardomer, was created in connection with the All Thing to decide cases which could not be settled at the Fjordlings Things, and 12 new godord were created to sit in this tribunal. The Fimtardomer should consist of 9 godord from each of the four districts, Fjordlingar, and the 12 new godord in all 48 but as the prosecution could discard six and the defense six, only thirty-six rendered the decision. This new tribunal proved to be very beneficial. The resorting to duels, holmgang, in settling disputes had become very common, but after the creation of the Fimtardomer, duels were abolished in Iceland, 1006. In 1022, the relations between Iceland and the mother country were definitely established by the agreement known as the institutions and laws which St. Olaf gave the Icelanders. We have already seen that by this agreement a quasi-Norwegian citizenship, which indeed they had enjoyed since Harald Harfager's reign, was granted the Icelanders, i.e. the right of Odal, the right to join the king's herd, to bring suits before the thing, to cut wood and timber, to inherit property, and to trade and traffic in Norway. In return for these privileges, they had to pay a small tax, landöre, and of those who happened to stay in Norway in time of war, two of every three had to do military service. The intellectual, no less than the economic and commercial relations, tended to strengthen the bonds between the colony and the mother country. Every year, ships from Iceland entered the harbors of Norway to carry back the wares needed at home, but still stronger were the ties knit by common religious and literary interests, a common language, and intimate intercourse in the fields of intellectual activity, which nursed strong the feeling that the people of the two countries were one nation. Christianity had been introduced in Iceland by Norwegian missionaries, sent by the Norwegian kings, and the two bishoprics in the island were joined to the archdiocese of Nidaros. In Iceland, saga literature and skaldic poetry flourished as nowhere else in the north, but most of the Icelandic skalds and sagamen stayed in Norway where they found welcome, honor, and reward at the king's court. The Icelanders felt, as keenly as did any Norseman at home, that the king of Norway and his court were the center of Norse intellectual and national life, and the embodiment of the strength and unity of the Norse nation. Of this they have given ample proof in their songs and sagas about the kings of Norway. 
but the old love of freedom and local autonomy was also kept alive in the aristocratic Republic of Iceland, and their political independence was lost only after internecine strife had paralyzed law and government, and created unbearable conditions which had made a strong central government a paramount necessity. Two principal defects in the political institutions of Iceland, the alienability of the Godord, and the absence of a central government, led gradually to the disappearance of popular government and the destruction of law and order. The thirty-nine Godur of the minor Thing districts were, besides the Lov Sigamund, the only officials in the Icelandic state. Their office, Godord, was hereditary. They were the wealthiest and most influential and powerful men in their community, and usually kept a band of forty to sixty armed followers. They had charge of the local administration, and were to maintain law and order in their communities. They sat in the Lagreta, where they exercised all legislative power, and they also appointed the judges, who performed the judicial functions at the various things. The Logmand and the Goder had to attend the Althing, and the Bunder, farmers, who had a small amount of property, were also required to attend. It is clear that the Goder, who had well nigh all the powers of government, were the pillars of the state. The more pernicious was the right which they possessed of alienating their office and of placing it in the hands of grasping and ambitious chieftains. Rival families gathered into their possession one godord after another, until a few powerful chieftains had usurped all political power, and ruled with sovereign power each in his own district. As no central government existed, their private feuds developed into a permanent state of civil war. They brought armies in the field and fought pitched battles. Houses were burned and property destroyed. The laws were a dead letter, since they could not be enforced. In 1217, a powerful family, the Ottoverjer, in southern Iceland, felt themselves offended by the Norwegian merchants, and attacked and plundered some Norwegian merchant vessels. The Stirlings sided with the merchants, and killed many of the Ottoverjer. The news of these disturbances was brought to Norway by the great saga writer Snorla Sturluson, who had to promise King Haakon to use his influence to bring Iceland under Norwegian overlordship. He was made Lendermand, and returned to Iceland, but he did not seem very eager to fulfill his promise, and as his countrymen resisted all attempts of that kind, nothing was accomplished. The struggle between the Icelandic chieftains continued. Snorra Sturluson's brother, Sigvat Sturluson, and his son, Sturla Sigvatsson, became very prominent in the century 1160-1262, which is also called the Stirling period. Stirla forced Snorra and his son Urukia to leave Iceland, but his arrogance so angered the other chieftains that they combined against the Stirlings, and defeated and killed both Stirla and his father in the Battle of Erlikstad in 1238. Snorra and his son had repaired to Norway to the court of Skula Jarl, and when they had heard that Stirla was dead, they made ready to return to Iceland. King Haakon had sent Snorra a message requesting him not to leave before he could make some arrangements with him regarding Iceland, but Snorra paid no heed and departed without seeing the king. After Skuli Jarl's death, Haakon instructed the Icelandic chieftain Gieser Thorvaldsson to send Snorra to Norway or else to kill him. Gieser had been married to Snorra's daughter, but had parted from her, and he and his father-in-law were bitter enemies. He marched with an armed band to Snorra's home, Reykholt, in Borgerfjord, and killed the great saga writer, who was then sixty-three years old, 1241. Snorra was a great historian, but his contemporaries describe him as self-seeking and treacherous. When King Haakon found that he could accomplish nothing in Iceland by the aid of the chieftains, he decided to strengthen his influence in the island by the assistance of the clergy. The bishops of Iceland had hitherto been chosen by the clergy and the people, but as this was contrary to the canon law, Haakon got the right of election transferred to the Archbishop of Nidaros and the cathedral chapter. By 1238, Norwegian ecclesiastics had been made bishops in Iceland, and they naturally sought to strengthen the hold of Norway in the island. While the bloody feuds continued unabated, Haakon summoned two of the leading chieftains, Thord Kakala and Gieser Thorvaldsson, to Norway and retained them there for some time. In 1255, he sent one of his own men, Ivar Engelson, to Iceland, who by the aid of Bishop Henrik of Holar, succeeded in getting the people of the northern districts to submit to the king. In 1258, Haakon made Gieser Thorvaldsson Jarl, 
and permitted him to return to Iceland after he had solemnly promised to bring the whole island into submission. Gieser did not act with much energy in the matter, and in 1261 the king sent Halvard Goldsko to Iceland. Through his efforts all the people of Iceland, save the eastern districts, were persuaded to take the oath of allegiance, and to acknowledge themselves subjects of the king of Norway. A compact was made between the king and the people of Iceland, stipulating what rights and privileges they were to enjoy. According to this compact they were to pay taxes to the king. They should keep their own laws, and they could not be summoned before a court outside of their own country. Six ships should sail from Norway to Iceland every year. The land or a tax should be abolished, the Lov Sigemund and the Sisselmanes should be Icelanders, and the island should be governed by a jarl appointed by the king. In 1264, the people of the eastern districts also tendered their submission to King Haakon. In 1261, Greenland had formally placed itself under the king of Norway. The Haakon Haakonsson saga says, That fall, Odd of Sjalta, Paul Magnusson, and Knarar leave, came from Greenland. They had been gone four winters. They said that the Greenlanders had resolved to pay the king taxes as well as fines for manslaughter whether the person killed was a Norseman or a Greenlander, and whether the murder happened in the settlements or in Northersether, so that the king now received Wergeld as far north as under the polar star. End of chapter 68。Chapter 69 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hawken Hawkinson's expedition to the Hebrides, the close of his reign. King Alexander the Second of Scotland had manifested a great desire to gain possession of the Hebrides. He was even on the point of beginning a war for this purpose when he suddenly died in twelve forty nine. His son Alexander the Third was then a mere child, and a regency was appointed to rule during his minority. The kings of Man and the Hebrides were loyal to King Hawken and for a time no danger seemed to threaten the colonial possessions. But when Alexander III became old enough to control the affairs of government, he revived his father's plan of joining the Hebrides to the Scotch kingdom. In 1261 he sent two envoys to Norway, as it appears for the purpose of persuading King Haakon to cede the islands, but the attempt was unsuccessful. In the summer of the following year news was brought to Norway that William Earl of Ross, together with many other Scotch chieftains, had attacked the island of Skye, and harried it most cruelly, the report adding that it was King Alexander's intention to conquer all the isles. The attack was evidently made by his orders, since hostages were carried to Scotland, where they were kept in custody at the Iverness Castle at the expense of the government. This made Hawken very angry, and by the advice of his council he decided to declare war. In the spring of 1263 he began to make preparations for an expedition to Scotland. He committed the government at home to his son Magnus, and collected a large fleet at Bergen. An advanced squadron of eight vessels was dispatched to aid King Magnus Olafsson of Man, but because of stormy weather it did not reach its destination before the main fleet arrived on the coast of Scotland. On the 5th of July the king sailed from Bergen, accompanied by Magnus Jarl of the Orkneys, who had been called to Norway as it seems for the purpose of assisting in the undertaking. How large the fleet was is not definitely stated in the saga, which says that Hawken had over 120 ships when the whole fleet was assembled in the Hebrides. The old Scotch historian Fordun states that he had 160 ships and 20,000 men, which agrees quite well with the saga. This was probably the largest army ever sent from Norway to the British Isles, and great alarm spread through the coast districts of Scotland, where the attack might be expected at any time. Hawkins sailed by way of the Shetland Islands to the Orkneys, where he stopped for a few days to work out a more detailed plan of campaign. He would divide his fleet into two squadrons, one which would go to Moray Firth and attack the eastern districts of Scotland, while the king himself would proceed to the Hebrides with the other. But his captains refused to go anywhere except under the king's direct command, and the plan had to be abandoned. While waiting for their forces from the Orkneys to complete their preparations, he went to Caithness, and compelled the people to pay tribute because they had accepted the overlordship of the king of Scotland. 
He offered them peace if they would pay a certain amount, probably of stores and provisions, and they promptly accepted the terms. King Alexander III strengthened the garrisons and defenses of the castles in all the districts where an attack might be expected. At Iverness, on Moray Firth, at Eyre and Wigtoon, in the southern part, and even at Stirling, the garrisons were strengthened, and energetic measures were taken to collect ships and to build new ones. On the 10th of August, Hawken left the Orkneys. The forces of these islands had not yet completed their armament, but they were ordered to follow as soon as they could. They sailed by the way of Lewis into the Sound of Skye, and came to anchor at the little island of Kelichstan, Norse Kerlikorstein, where he was joined by the King of Man and the forces which had been dispatched to that island. When he entered the Sound of Mull, King Dugald of the Hebrides met him in a light craft, and piloted the fleet to Carrara, where the forces from the islands had assembled to join the main fleet. Both King Magnus Olafsson of Man and King Dugald MacRory, Roydri, of the Hebrides were royal to King Hawken, but Eogon of Aragal, whom he had given the title of king and invested with the island of Mull, had joined Alexander the Third. Eogan had large fiefs on the mainland of Scotland, and as he found it impossible to serve two masters, he dropped his royal title and with it his allegiance to King Hawken. From Carrera, Hawken sent fifty ships in command to King Dugald, King Magnus, and some Norwegian ships to Cantir, and fifteen ships to the castle of Rothsay in the island of Boot. With the rest of the fleet he advanced to the island of Giga. The lords Mercad and Angus of Cantir came to Hawken to offer their submission, and took an oath of allegiance to him, but they had to pay a tribute of twelve hundred head of cattle. The castle of Rothsay also capitulated without much resistance. Envoys now also came from Ireland to King Hawken, and offered the submission of the people of Ireland, if he would deliver them from the oppressive English rule. It is not stated who these envoys were, but it is quite clear that they came from the Norse colonies, who felt sorely oppressed under English rule. It has already been stated elsewhere that the English had taken their cities, and had forced the Norsemen to withdraw and found new settlements outside the city limits. Hawkins sent Sigurd from the Hebrides to Ireland with some light vessels to investigate the conditions, while he moved his fleet around Cantir to the island of Aran. Hawkins' large fleet, as well as the victories which they had already won, so alarmed King Alexander the Third that he sent messengers to sue for peace, and Hawken welcomed this opportunity to terminate the hostilities. The summer was nearly spent, and he foresaw the danger of exposing his fleet to the severe autumn storms in these dangerous waters. An armistice was arranged, but King Alexander would not accept the terms offered, and much time was wasted in fruitless negotiations. Finally, Hawken grew impatient and gave notice that he would renew the campaign. He had advanced up the Firth of Clyde, whence he sent sixty ships into Loch Long, while the main force was to land at Largs to fight the Scotch army stationed there. The forces sent to Loch Long brought the boats to Loch Lomond, and ravaged the country as far as Stirling. But on the 1st and 2nd of October, a hurricane swept over western Scotland, and put a sudden end to further operations. Ten ships of the squadron in Loch Long foundered, and of the main fleet at Largs, many ships were damaged or driven ashore. The king sought refuge in the island of Cumrey, Cymru, but many ships drifted to the mainland, where they were attacked by the Scots. When the storm abated somewhat, the king again went on board the ships, and sent aid to the men on shore. The Scots were driven off, and the Norse detachments spent the night on land. In the morning, October 2nd, the Scotch main army came up. About 1,000 Norsemen were now on shore, of whom 240 were stationed on a hillock. They were attacked by overwhelming numbers. Many fell, and the rest fled to the shore, where they made a spirited resistance. At last, two captains succeeded in landing fresh troops, and the Scots were driven back upon the hill, and finally put to flight. The battle was over, and the Norsemen returned to their ships. The next morning they landed again, removed the dead from the battlefield, and buried them near a church, probably in the island of Boot. The squadron from Loch Long again joined the fleet, and Hawken destroyed his stranded ships, and moved his fleet to Lambash Harbor. Sigurd of the Hebrides, who had been sent to Ireland, now returned with a message from the Irish people to the king that they would keep his army the whole winter if he would come and deliver them from the English. He called a thing to consider this proposal, but his men were opposed to it as it was late in the season, 
and they were short of provisions. He decided, therefore, to go into winter quarters in the Orkneys, and many of his men were permitted to return to Norway. After a very stormy voyage, he reached these islands during the last days of October. King Hawken, who was now fifty-nine years old, seems to have overexerted himself in this strenuous naval campaign. Not long after his arrival in the Orkneys, sickness confined him to his bed. During his illness, says the saga, he had the Bible and Latin books read to him, but it soon seemed to fatigue him to catch the meaning of the words. He then let Norwegian books be read, day and night, first the sagas of the saints, and where there were no more of them, the sagas of the kings of Norway from Hofdan Svarta, one after the other. He died, deeply mourned by the whole nation, December 15, 1263, and was succeeded by his son Magnus Lagabater. His body was brought to Bergen, and interred in the Christ Church by the side of his father and grandfather. The celebrated Battle of Largs was in reality only a skirmish, in which the Norwegians were victorious. But this great expedition, and the disaster which overtook it, seems to have brought the leading men to ponder the situation more carefully. They began to see how difficult it was to defend the Hebrides, lying snug to the shores of Scotland, when even vessels like Eogan of Argyll sided with the King of Scotland. Could Norway afford to keep a dependency like the Hebrides, when her whole naval force would have to be kept in constant service to defend it? King Magnus Lagabutter and his advisers were wise enough to see that such a cause would not only be futile, but ruinous, and steps were soon taken to conclude peace with Scotland. After negotiations had been carried on for some time, King Alexander agreed to buy Hebrides and men. By the Treaty of Perth, signed July 2, 1266, Magnus transferred these islands to Scotland for the sum of 4,000 marks sterling, payable in four annual installments. Scotland also agreed to pay every year perpetually 100 marks to the crown of Norway. A fine of 10,000 marks sterling was to be paid by the party who violated or did not fulfill the treaty. At the time when the treaty was concluded, King Magnus Olafsson of Man was already dead. This island was never formally united with Scotland, but was held by the kings of Scotland as a personal possession until it was finally transferred to the crown of England. End of chapter 69「Chapter 70 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Literature and Culture in the Age of Hawken Hawkinson The Old Norse Poetic Literature, i.e. the Elder Edda and the Songs of the Skalds, flourished principally in the period from Harald Horfagra until the middle of the 11th century. After Harald Horfagra's time, the skaldic poesy began to decay. Many familiar names are indeed met with later, but they indicate no revival of the old art of poetry. The three great skalds of Hawken Hawkinson's own time, the historian Snorra Sturluson and his two nephews Sturla Thorson and Olaf Fitheskald, possessed great ability as poets, but the vigor and spontaneity had gone out of their verse and Snorra and Sturla are famous principally as historians and prose writers. Snorra wrote his younger Edda as a textbook for skalds with the intention, as it seems, of creating new interest in the noble old art. It is one of the most valuable works in Old Norse literature, but it failed to produce the result intended. The age of Norse poetry and song was fast drawing to a close. The chief interest now centered upon history and romance, and in the course of the 13th century the Old Norse prose literature reached its fullest development. It embraces works on the most varied subjects, history, biography, geography, legend, and romance, all known by the common name of saga, i.e. narrative, to which must also be added treatises on grammar, mythology, and poetry, codes of laws, and other miscellaneous works. The sagas are written in a style of noble simplicity and classic beauty. Rich in contents, fascinating in form and diction, they rank with the Eddic songs among the greatest achievements in the domain of literature. Few persons in our day adequately realize the extent of the early Icelandic literature or its richness, says Professor John Fiske. The poems, legends, and histories earlier than the date when Dante walked and mused in the streets of Florence, survive for us now in some hundreds of works, 
for the most part of rare and absorbing interest. The Heimskringla, or Chronicle of Snorla Sturluson, written about 1215, should be about 1230, is one of the greatest history books in the world. The historical sagas may be divided into three great groups, the Icelandic family sagas, dealing with the history and biography of the great families in Iceland, the sagas about the kings of Norway, the sagas about the Norwegian colonies. This literature began to flourish both in Norway and Iceland towards the middle of the 12th century, and reached its zenith in Haakon Haakonsson's reign. The old Icelandic writer, Ara Froda, 1148, has been called the father of Old Norse history writing. He wrote the Islendingabok, about 1134, and some scholars have held that he also began the Landnámabok, which was finished by later writers. About 1150, Erik Odson wrote the Hrithjarstiki, a history of Harald Gila and his successors, which has been lost. In the latter part of the same century, Odd Snorrison wrote the elder Olaf Saga Tryggvasonar. Gunnlaug Leifsson wrote another saga by the same name, Karl Jonsson wrote the Sverris Saga, and some unknown Icelander wrote the Bolglungusagur, or Saga of the Three Kings, Hakon Sverrisson, Guttorm Sigurdsson, and Inga Bordsson. In Norway, the monk Theodric, Theodricus Monachus, wrote a history of the kings of Norway, De Antiquitate Regum Norwegiensium, in the latter part of the 12th or the beginning of the 13th century. At about the same time, an unknown Norwegian ecclesiastic, probably in the Orkneys, wrote the Historia Norwegiae, the Algrip af Norregs Kuningesagum, the first attempt at a connected account of the kings of Norway in the Norse language, was also written about this time, but only a fragment of this work has been preserved. From the close of the 12th century, the Latin language, which hitherto has been used occasionally, ceased to be employed in saga literature. The Old Norse classic prose had been developed, and the taste for history writing had been fully awakened. The Morkinskina, a compilation of sagas about the Norwegian kings, was written by some unknown Icelandic author about 1220. A more critical work is the Fagerskina, also by an unknown Icelandic author, from the period 1220 to 1230. It gives the connected history of the kings of Norway from Hafton Svarta till 1177. On these earlier works, Snorra Sturluson based his Heimskringla, the greatest work of the Icelandic historiographers, written about 1230. Snorra's history is supplemented by the works of his nephew, Sturla Thordson, the last original Icelandic historian. He wrote the Islandinga saga, which constitutes the nucleus of the great Sturlunga saga, or the history of Iceland during the Sturlung period, 1160-1262. Also the Landnámabók, one of the most important sources for our knowledge of Germanic life, religion, and jurisprudence. King Magnus Halkinson became acquainted with Sturla Thordson and urged him, while on a visit to Norway, to write the history of his father's reign, the Halkin Halkinson saga, Halkinar saga Halkinarsalan. This saga, which is based on letters and documents of the royal archives, is the most important source of the history of the Scandinavian North in the 13th century, and gives a vivid picture of Haakon Haakonsson's reign. Because of King Haakon's friendship with Emperor Frederick II and his relations to the Lübeckers and others, it is also of importance to the history of Germany. This saga seems to have been written shortly after 1263. On a second visit to Norway, Sturla was persuaded to write the history of Magnus Haakonsson's reign, the Magnus Saga Haakonarsonar, but only a fragment of this saga remains. To the historical works written about the kings of Norway belongs also the historical Olaf Saga in Helga, from about 1250, while the legendary Olaf Saga must be classified with the legendary and religious literature. Several later works like the Hulda, the Hrokenskina, the Golenskina, and the Erspenil bear no longer the marks of critical and original scholarship. The sagas which deal exclusively with the Norwegian colonies are the Færinga saga, found in the sagas of Olaf Tryggvason and Olaf the Saint in the Flatejarbok. The original, which no longer exists, may have been written in Iceland about 1200 or a little later. The Orkneyinga saga, also found in the Flatejarbok, is thought to have been written before 1250. The saga of Eric the Red, which deals with the history of the Norse colonies in Greenland, and the discovery of the mainland of North America, 
is found in two manuscripts, the older from the 13th century, in the Hauksbok, the later dates from the 15th century. The Flatyarbok is a great collection of sagas and short stories, Thater, written in 1387 to 1395 by two Icelandic priests, Jón Thorsson and Magnus Thorhalsson. The compilers show little originality or critical ability, still the Flatyarbok remains one of the most fruitful sources of our knowledge of Norwegian history and culture. Of special importance for the history of Iceland are the sagas dealing with the church history of the island, the Kristni saga, which treats of the introduction of Christianity and the early history of the church in Iceland, the Biskupa sagar, and the Hungrvaka, which give the history of the bishops of Iceland. The Icelandic saga writers have also devoted some attention to the history of Denmark. The Jomsvikinga saga narrates the history of the Jomsvikings and the Jomsborg, and the Knitlinga saga contains the history of the Danish kingdom from 950 till 1202. Most of the Icelandic family sagas were written in the period 1200 to 1300. The more important are Egil's saga, Laxdöla saga, Gunlaug saga, Oerbygja saga, Fostbrödra saga, Ljósvetninga saga, Rikdöla saga, Laupenfördinga saga, Hardar saga, Viga Glum saga, Hunsa Thore saga, Gisla saga Sur Sonar, Njal saga, That's Döla saga, Kormak saga, Kreti saga, Gulthore saga, Svarfdöla saga, Bjarna saga Hit Döla kapa, and Floamana saga. A second main division of the Icelandic saga literature is formed by the large number of the mythological sagas dealing with the heroic traditions of the Scandinavian north, the Fornaldarsagar Norderlanda. Among the best known of these are Völsunga saga, Frithjof saga, Örvar Ad saga, Hervarr saga, Ragna saga Lothbrokar, and Hrolf saga. Another important part of the Icelandic prose literature are the numerous works of a religious character, such as collections of homilies and sagas or stories about the apostles and saints. In this extensive literature we find the sagas or stories of Virgin Mary, John the Baptist, the Heilagramana Sagar, Sagas of the Saints, Postula Sagar, or Lives of the Apostles, besides a long list of sagas about persons prominent in the New Testament such as Peter and Paul, John and James, Simon and Jude, Martha and Mary Magdalene, Stephen, Pilate, and others. To this literature belongs also the Stjorn, a large work consisting of translations of the historical books and other portions of the Old Testament, together with commentaries. The greater portion of this Bible translation dates from about 1250. Aside from the Latin historical works already mentioned, the Norwegian sagamen devoted themselves almost exclusively to the writing of fiction, consisting largely of translations or elaborations into prose narratives of chivalric metrical romances introduced from England and the continent, especially from France. These have been called Fornsöger Suderlande. E. Sars says, The Norwegian court seems to have given the first impulse to the activity which in the course of the 13th century transplanted many French chivalric romances and other foreign literary productions, into the Norwegian tongue. About Tristan and Isolde's saga, one of the earliest chivalric romances in the Norse language, it is specifically stated in one of the manuscripts that it was written at the request of Hawken Hawkinson. The event seems to be true of the Elis saga, Eventh saga, and many other works translated from the French. King Hawken's relatives and successors, who like himself had been well educated, also seem to have been interested in this kind of literary activity, and to have acted as its patrons and promoters. According to an old source, the Barlum Saga of Josephats is supposed to have been written by King Hawken Sverreson, who seems, however, to have been confounded with Hawken the Younger, King Hawken Hawkinson's eldest son. From Norway, this literary activity of recasting foreign stories into narratives in the Norse tongue was also introduced into Iceland but these stories did not become popular there, as the style was best suited to the tastes of knights and courtiers.
The Icelanders usually based their narratives on Norwegian translations, not on the original text, and many of these sagas, such as Thiedrek saga, the Karla Magnus saga, and others are therefore found in widely different Norwegian and Icelandic versions. One of the most important and interesting works in Old Norse literature is The King's Mirror, Old Norse, Old Norse Konung Skugjo, Latin Speculum Regale. Written in the reign of Haakon Haakonsson, about 1250 to 1260, by an anonymous Norwegian author, who must have lived in Namdalen near Trindelagen. This work occupies a unique position in Old Norse literature. It is a didactic philosophic treatise in the form of a dialogue between a father and his son, in which the author planned to describe the education, culture, and manners of the four classes of Norwegian society, merchants, courtiers, farmers, bønder, and clergy. The father gives this description so that the son may choose his calling with insight, and that he may know what he must learn in order to become successful and honored in his profession. Only two parts have been written, but even in its fragmentary form it gives the most vivid picture of medieval Norwegian society, especially of the upper classes, of any work in existence. It is worthy of note that the agricultural class, Bunder, is treated not only as an independent and highly respected class, but as a separate estate equal in rank to the courtiers and the clergy. This was something quite unusual at this time, when the agricultural classes elsewhere in Europe had sunk into abject serfdom. It is equally worthy of attention that the merchants also formed a distinct class, no less highly regarded than the others. The father says to his son, Though I have been more a king's man, i.e. a courtier, than a merchant, still I would find no fault if you would choose this profession, for it is now often chosen by the best men. That the agricultural and merchant classes should stand so high is quite remarkable, when we consider that even the third estate, the citizen of the larger cities, had gained but scant recognition elsewhere in Europe. The father goes on to outline to his son what he must study if he wishes to become a real merchant. He points out the necessity of avoiding drinking and gambling, of being upright, Christian-minded, well-dressed, polite, and cultured, as this constitutes the general basis for a successful career. He must also study the laws, especially the Bjarkijaretr, or Norwegian municipal laws. He must know the manners and customs of every country where he travels, and if he wishes to be especially well qualified, he should study all languages, especially Latin and French, for they reach farthest, but neither must thou neglect thine own language. He advises his son also to get a thorough knowledge of the courses of the heavenly bodies, of the tides, and other natural phenomena of importance to navigation. He must become especially well-versed also in arithmetic, which is indispensable to merchants. He instructs him how to equip his ships for the voyage, in what seasons of the year he should sail, and what rules he is to observe in doing business. He gives the young man very detailed and elaborate instruction in political and physical geography, in which branches he shows deep interest and remarkable knowledge. He discusses the ocean currents, the prevailing winds, the aurora borealis, the volcanoes, geysers, warm springs, and earthquakes in Iceland, and the glaciers and icebergs in Greenland. He gives a description of Ireland and Iceland, and discusses the climate and the conditions in Greenland with great minuteness and with considerable accuracy. He says to his son, But since thou doest ask if the sun shines in Greenland, or whether it happens that there is fine weather as in other countries, then thou must know, forsooth, that there is fine sunshine, and that the climate there in the summer time may be called good. But there is great difference in the seasons, for the winter is almost a perpetual night, and summer almost a continuous day. But when the sun is highest, it is strong enough to give light, but it gives but little heat. Still, it is so strong that where the ground is free from ice, it is warm so much that it produces good and fragrant grass. Therefore people can easily inhabit the land where it is thawed up, but that is indeed only a small area. He describes the fishes and animals in the ocean near Iceland and Greenland, and discusses in detail the fauna of Greenland, the domestic animals of this country, its products, exports and imports, and the mode of life of the people. In the second part, in which he discusses the courtier class, he speaks of the manners and customs of the court, of the power of the king, of the nature and value of the government, and instructs his son in military science and the use of arms. 
If we compare this system of education with the established curriculum of the schools in other countries of Europe at that time, we are struck by its superiority over all school plans then existing. The schoolmen were yet confining instruction to their trivium and quadrivium, which embraced little more than Latin and scholastic dialects. Of geography there was none, excepting that might be incidentally mentioned as explanatory notes to Latin texts. The mother tongue was banished from the schools, as were all modern languages, natural science was not taught. Natural science was very much neglected in the Middle Ages. With extraordinary credulity the people regarded the most incredible as true, and being prepossessed by a belief in invented phantasms and wonders, they did not see God's true wonders in creation, says Carl von Raumer. The author of The King's Mirror finds it necessary for the young man, the prospective merchant, who wishes to be well educated, to study not only Latin but French, and especially his own mother tongue, yes, all languages, which simply means as many languages as possible. He has to learn the laws of trade and commerce, he must study the courses of the heavenly bodies and the changing seasons, i.e. astronomy. He must learn practical navigation, and he must devote a special attention to the study of nature, climate, ocean currents, glaciers, icebergs, volcanoes, earthquakes, and animal life on sea and land. He must also study political geography, the customs and manners of all nations which he comes in contact with, their products, their imports and exports. Besides acquiring such training, both practical and theoretical, he should also be a Christian and cultured gentleman. This system of education is so modern in spirit and general purpose that with but a few modifications we might well accept it today without much hesitation. A little reflection and comparison make us feel the truth of the great scholar Sophus Bugge's statement that the king's mirror was five centuries ahead of its time. Strong evidence indeed that no people in Europe were better educated than the Norwegians. The remarkable growth of Norse prose literature in the 13th century represents the culmination of a long literary development, and cannot be directly attributed to the influence of the reign of Haakon Haakonsson. Still, the court of the King of Norway was in this period, as heretofore, the center of the intellectual life of the Norwegian people. It was the place where men of learning and ability met, where the impulses from abroad were most directly felt, and where many of the leading works were written. Karl Jonsson wrote the Sverres saga at King Sverre's court, and by his aid. Sturla Thordson was persuaded by King Magnus Hawkinson, Lagerbötter, to write the Hawkin Hawkinson saga at King Magnus's court, and by his assistance. The Volsung saga is thought to have been written at the court of Hawkin Hawkinson for the entertainment of the king, and a part of the Stjorn was written at the request of King Hawkin Magnusson, died 1319. It is certain also that Snorra Sturluson was encouraged, especially by Skula Jarl, to write the Younger Edda and the Heimskringla. King Hawkins' peaceful and glorious reign and his lofty example proved a powerful stimulus. He was well educated and could read Latin as well as Norse. He was intensely interested in literature and art. Anxious to further the intellectual development of his people, as he was careful to preserve the power and honor of his kingdom and the prosperity of the nation. The king of Norway was to the Norwegian people what King Arthur was to the knights of the round table, the source of national unity and strength, by whose influence and power they felt themselves united into one nation. The king was the bond of union between the colonies and the mother country, and the source of national tradition and honor. This would alone explain the great influence which the king and his court exerted on the development of literature and culture and the growth of national spirit. King Hawken took great interest also in commerce and the development of cities. On the coast of Bohuslen he founded the city of Marstrand, probably because of the great herring fisheries along this coast. He improved the harbor of Ugdenes at the entrance to the Trondhjemsfjord, and constructed wharfs there. He also sought to protect Norwegian commerce by treaties with England and Lübeck. King Valdemar the Victorious and his successors had not been friendly to Norway and when war broke out between Denmark and the German city of Lübeck, Norwegian shipping was injured by both parties. Hawken, therefore, seized the ships both of the Danes and of the Lübeckers in Norwegian harbors, a measure which proved so effective that the merchants of Lübeck sent John de Bardevik as ambassador to Bergen to apologize to King Hawken. The result was a commercial treaty between Norway and Lübeck, 
concluded October 6, 1250. Treaties of commerce were also signed with the King of England. Hawken devoted much attention to the improvement of the coast defenses. It seems to have been his plan to construct a system of fortresses which would safeguard all important harbors and protect the whole coast. He rebuilt the Sverreborg at Bergen, reconstructed the Sverreborg at Trondheim, erected a fortress at Ragenhilderholm, near Konghella, and fortified Oslo and Tunsberg. The many churches, monasteries, hospitals, and other public buildings erected during this reign testify to Hawkins' great interest in cities and city culture. At Bergen he erected the Hawkins Hall, a large two-story royal hall of stone, built in early English style. It stood completed in 1261, when the wedding of his son Magnus was celebrated there. In later centuries this fine piece of early Norwegian architecture suffered much through neglect, but it has been restored, and it remains one of the proudest old structures which adorns the city. The Hawken Hawkinson saga gives the following account of his activity as a builder. He built a church in Tromsø and Christianized the whole parish belonging to it. Many Permians came to him, who had fled from the east because of the inroads of the Tartars. These he Christianized, and he permitted them to settle on the Malingerfjord. He built a church at Offerton, a redoubt and piers for wharfs at Ogdenes. In Nidaros he built a hall in connection with the royal residence, as well as a chapel over against the royal hostelries. In Bergen he built the Apostle Church of Stone near the royal residence. He also built a St. Olaf's church and a monastery at his own expense. He improved the royal residence at Bergen by erecting two stone halls, and by surrounding it with a stone wall with castles above the portals. He built the St. Catherine Church at Sandbrü, together with a hospital, and gave to it property yielding an income of 200 Maunathermather. In the castle at Bergen he rebuilt all the houses which had been destroyed by fire. He erected two-thirds of the surrounding stone wall with embrasures, and built the outer castle. The All Saints Church at the upper end of the Vaug, i.e. the fjord, was also built according to the king's advice, and he gave to it one hundred Maunathermather during his illness. At Ogvaldsnes he built a stone church, the fourth in size of all the parish churches in Norway. At Tunsberg he constructed a castellated stone wall around the mountain, and built the Gauta castle across the Daneklev. He built also the necessary houses on the mountain, erected a royal residence near the St. Lawrence Church, and built a hospital near the St. Olaf's Church, to which he gave property yielding an income of 300 marks. He caused the channel at Skeljastein to be deepened, so that Kugger, i.e. merchant ships, could now sail where ferry boats could scarcely float before. He built the Barefoot Brothers Church at Tunsberg, but moved it later to Dragsmark, where he erected a St. Mary's cloister in a stone church, to which he gave property yielding an income of fifty marks. In Oslo he built a castle on the Valkeberg, and moved the St. Nicholas Church thither. He also built the royal residence on the islands. On the Valdis home he also built houses. At Konghella he erected a castle on the Roggenhildsholm. He built a royal dwelling in the city, and houses on Gulöen. He cleared the Ecker Islands, and built houses and a wooden church there. He likewise founded Marstrand, and erected buildings in many islands in Viken. He erected a stone castle at Ringsaker on Lake Mjösen, and built houses there. He built also a hall at Steig, and repaired the church which was nearly in ruins. He also built a hall at Hof in Breiden, and donated property to it, and at Tofta he built a hall and a chapel. He bought Lo in Opdal and built dwelling houses, hall, and chapel there. In Hedemarken he erected halls at Husebø, in Skaun, and at Ringsaker, and he caused dwelling houses to be built at Vidheim in Urya. He also constructed a stone wall around the Sverreborg at Stenbergena, and build houses there, since the Bogler had destroyed the castle. This catalogue of the great king's many achievements furnishes all necessary evidence of his remarkable energy, and proves how great was his solicitude for the intellectual development as well as for the social and economic welfare of the nation. The greatest architectural work of King Hawkins' reign was the building of the nave of the Trondheim Cathedral. After the death of Archbishop Oystein in 1188, 
the work on the cathedral seems to have been discontinued. His successor, Archbishop Erik Iverson, engaged in a bitter controversy with King Sverre, and was forced to leave the country in 1190. Sverre charged him with keeping a large force of armed followers, as if he feared an attack upon himself or his church. That he thus spent the money which he should have used to keep workmen in the quarries carrying and cutting stone for the construction of the cathedral according to the original plan. Whether Eric's successors, Torre Gudmundsson, 1206-1214, and Guttorm, 1215-1224, continued the work is not known, but it was not resumed with vigor till in the time of Archbishop Sigur Eindridesson, 1231-1252. He began the erection of the nave, which seems to have been nearly completed in the time of Archbishop Jon, 1268 to 1282. The nave, which like the chancel was built in the Gothic style, was the most ornate and imposing part of the great cathedral. According to the old writer Absalon Peterson Bayer, 1530 to 1574, the west front had a large gilt circular window cut in stone. Peter Clausen Fries, 1545 to 1614, a priest in southern Norway, says of it, But about that same cathedral, how it was built or how large it is, I can write nothing save what I have heard of others, namely that it is built in the form of a cross, of cut stones which are chiseled into all sorts of figures round about the whole church, both inside and outside, so that it is astonishing, and in the west front, which is gilt, large images of the twelve apostles are cut in stone and gilt and there are numerous pillars of polished marble, both inside and outside in the church, both white and black and of different color, so smooth that one might think they had been cast. In the southern portal there are about sixty pillars ingeniously wrought, so that one cannot well estimate what this single door has cost, not to mention the whole church. How the nave looked when completed it is difficult to determine, for it was scarcely finished when a series of accidents gradually reduced the proud edifice to a melancholy ruin. But the Norwegian people, who have always cherished piously the memories of their past history, have long since made its restoration a national cause. Since 1869 the work of rebuilding the great cathedral has been in progress under the leadership of the best architects and sculptors in the country. Large sums are contributed yearly to the cause by individuals and private organizations as well as by the state, and before many years have rolled by, the old church will again lift its proud towers over the city of Trondheim. End of chapter 70